Change the decision. All right. If I could get everybody's attention, um, real quick announcement. We are basically at capacity, uh, but I was just informed um, by the wizard behind the wall here that we've opened up overflow. So if you want to sit down, you're welcome to sit down outside and watch it on the big screen out there um, rather than stand on the stairs. So um, would like you to be comfortable. Of course, if you have a question, you really can't ask it if you're out there. So <laughs> I don't know what to do about that. Um, yeah, there's a couple of seats here that um, uh, if you want to come up and take them, please do. All right. Outstanding. Um, well, uh, it's great to see everybody here at the Baker Institute. I'm Ken Medlock. I'm the director of the Center for Energy Studies here. Um, we uh, uh, are really happy to be able to kick off uh, this academic year with this kind of event. Uh, I think it's a fantastic one. And I'm um, beyond pleased to be able to have uh, Russell Gold and Michael Skelly up here with me. Um, I don't really think I need to make long introductions. Uh, most people are probably aware of who, uh, who I have here next to me. Um, the, uh, the subject of today um, is uh, uh, Russell's latest book. Um, he's written a couple recently on, on the evolution of the energy space in the U.S. Um, one was the boom and, and now superpower. Um, and uh, we're also fortunate uh, in the case of superpower, which will be the context of our discussion today, to have the principal protagonist uh, sitting next to Russell. So it should make for an interesting conversation. Um, the way we're going to sort of uh, work through the conversation today is I'm going to ask a couple of leading questions. Uh, I have a feeling that um, uh, knowing Russell and Michael, this will kind of get a life of its own uh, and we'll be able to move pretty quickly through a lot of different things. Um, but I do want to afford everybody in the audience a chance to ask questions. So um, when I do flip it out to you guys, please just uh, raise your hand and I will do my best to go in order. Uh, there's no promise. It's a packed house. So, um, but I do want to try to get as many questions from the audience in uh, so these guys can have a chance to answer them. Um, so with that, uh, uh, I will just say the, the, the topic um, of superpower is a really interesting, interesting one to me from a research perspective um, because um, going back actually all the way to 2008, a colleague of mine and I, uh, Peter Hartley and I, wrote a, a piece looking at uh, the p potential for high voltage direct current transmission to actually play differential time of peaks uh, in Texas and California, looking at solar power potentially in, 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 in Southern California and wind in, in the panhandle of Texas. So uh, when I actually looked at, uh, I remember when Michael was actually working on the, on the Clean Line project, um, I thought it was pretty novel. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. It was a fantastic way to actually play that, those differential peaks and um, uh, provide uh, access to uh, wind energy uh, from an area that is uh, prolific in terms of wind energy resource, uh, namely the Panhandle of Oklahoma, to, to an area that uh, is really looking for different ways to uh, develop access to clean energy resources. So um, I thought it was interesting to see what he was working on and actually think about the project we had done. And um, at that time, we were looking at, at nanowire capabilities, sort of thinking about things that were going over, on over in the Smalley Institute, and it, it kind of didn't go anywhere. But um, uh, nevertheless, sometimes when you're that far out in front, it doesn't, uh, but it doesn't mean it never will. So, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a little, little lead there, right? But um, uh, uh, one of the things that um, I want to sort of just launch the conversation with, and I'm going to direct this question to, to Russell and Michael. I know you'll probably have something to say to jump in here because you were a willing participant. Um, but, but Russell, what, what motivated you to, to do this project? When I think about um, climate change, uh, and, and this book is not specifically about climate change, but I think it's informed by climate change, uh, there's a balance between hope and despair that's going on, I think, throughout our entire culture. Um, you hear about what's going on in the Amazon rainforest and despair. Uh, and I think it needs to be balanced by hope, some sense that there are technologies, there are ways to organize markets, governments to, to, to rise to this challenge. And as a writer, when I looked out at the books that had been written about climate change, I think they were, they were all on the despair side of the equation. Uh, they were all on the everything's going wrong, this is, we're losing um, all these animals and, and ecosystems. And I wanted to write something on the hope side. 
I wanted to write about the people who are out there doing something uh, to try to uh, arrest the progress of climate change, to slow climate change down. Uh, and to me, that's, there's a technology story, there's, a, uh, there's an entrepreneurial story, there's an energy development story. I mean, what are you doing? What are people doing? And so I wanted to, to find someone, group of people who were out there doing that and to try to tell their story uh, as a way to provide a little bit of balance. Uh, because for me, uh, I, I think that that's important as a storyteller, to give people some hope that there are, there are, there are options out there. Uh, if we don't have hope, then, then the dis despair wins. Um, Michael, uh, sort of jumping on that, I know you've been involved in the renewable energy business for a couple of decades. Um, uh, I wonder if you can sort of reflect on that just briefly and then talk about, you know, what motivated you to work with Russell on this particular So, a um, couple, couple of sort of very important conversations that I had as I thought about this. Uh, so Russell uh, came to me about five years ago and said, hey, I wrote this book, The Boom, I want to write a book about renewable energy. Uh, I want somebody to help sort of carry the story. I think the literary term for that is the, a donkey. So he needed, <laughs> he needed a yes, donkey. It is. <laughs> and, uh, in the transmission business, one does feel like a donkey at many times. <laughs> and so uh, I thought about it. My partner, uh, a couple of my partners just hated the idea because they just said, this no good can come. And Sarah remembers these conversations. Um, and uh, Jeff Cohen is a good buddy, and many of y'all know him. From the, he was the editor of the Chronicle at the time, and he said, "You know, you really ha you kind of have to do this because people want to understand how renewable energy works, what's the potential, uh, can we actually solve some of these issues with renewables?" And uh, so that checked one box, and then the other was uh, I talked to Todd Mitchell, who is whose family is uh, prominently featured in the Boom. And I said, you know, like... Son of George Mitchell, founder yes. of yeah. Father of Fracking. Yes. And I said, what, what do you think? Should, do I, do you, I, I sort of know this guy, but do, should I trust the guy or not? And he said, yeah, Russell kind of got it right and, and was fair with the story. And, you know, remember, we had no idea how this was going to turn out at the time. And uh, the agreement that we struck along the way was that he would have pretty much full access to all of our internal deliberations and what was going on with the company and so on. Uh, but he couldn't violate uh, something, a non-scientific sounding, a non-scientific thing that I made up, <laughs> the Eisenberg uncertainty principle, which was that he couldn't go FOIA, TVA, or DOE while they're trying, he couldn't measure the object of our entreaties or commercial efforts or whatever because in doing so he would disturb those uh, right. those uh, molecules yes and uh, so that was kind of the only deal that we had but other than that he uh, he I think he had pretty much unfettered access mm -hmm. other than the people in the company who thought this was a really stupid idea and <laughs> would not talk to him for a long time that's very true yeah <laughs> oh I'm sorry okay <laughs> All right, we'll speak up. I'll, yeah, that is much better. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully the we're all mic'd, so um, apologies. Uh, and I should say when I when I went to the offices of CleanLine, which is the company you co-founded and were running, um, they, they had conference rooms that were basically fish bowls, glass uh, glass walled conference rooms. And I'd be going in there and be sitting with, with Skelly and uh, maybe one or two other people. And you could always tell who didn't like the project because they would kind of be looking through the glass, just like <laughs> either casting, you know, dirty looks at me or at you or probably both. But uh, it worked out and they, you know, I think everyone, I don't know. I mean, do you think everyone was happy? Yeah, I think people were happy with the, uh, uh, the whole process and, uh, but it, it was, you know, what you were doing, and we haven't even so much talked about it, but you were trying to build a big <coughs> transmission line was incredibly difficult. I mean, it took a lot of focus. And my, my sense was one of the concerns was is that to have this writer kind of in and out of the office was a distraction that y'all didn't need. Yeah, but um, Russell sort of acted as, as my confessor for a number of years, for free, by the way. <laughs> um, and uh, so I think, I don't think it was that big a distraction. 
Um, that's, that's actually a great segue into the next question I wanted to ask. Um, the renewable space, and in particular, I know your, your uh, experience, Michael, um, it, it's filled with a lot of challenges and also a lot of opportunities, and, and those span both the economic and regulatory dimensions. I wonder if we can just sort of dive right into uh, some of your experiences and uh, uh, how they played out and where you think things might be going ultimately. Well, that's a lot. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so uh, I got my start in project development, and, and by the way, buy the book, um, because we need, I have no economics in this, so I can say this, but we need uh, people like Russell to write books about nerdy but important topics like this, and the way we encourage them to do so is by buying the book. So, um, But I, I got my start in project development building a ski lift in the rainforest of Costa Rica, and then that led to hydro and then wind development and so on. And uh, we started Clean Line because we recognized that the, one of the biggest challenges was uh, trying to get energy from where the resource is really good to where, where people live and where we consume a lot of power. And I mean, Ken, you nailed it a decade ago. And uh, that wire that you proposed back then makes absolute sense because right now in California, it's about 3 p.m. and the sun is shining really bright. I am certain that power prices are in the basement. Somebody can Google this and find out, but I'm sure that power is like free right now in California. Um, and we're using a lot of power right now in Texas, so we could use some of it. And conversely, the wind energy uh, picks up particularly at night. And uh, as, as, as sort of the evening sets in in, Cal in, in Texas, wind picks up and we could feed the afternoon peak in, in California. So everybody you know, recognizes that this is, this is a, uh, a really optimal solution to build more grid, uh, to connect resources. It also enables you to have, if you've got a variable resource, uh, by having a more interconnected system, uh, you can better optimize those. So, and we'd spent a lot of time uh, sort of thinking about this and went to a bunch of conferences about transmission and it wasn't entirely clear what was bigger, the industry of, of building a national grid or the industry of talking about building a national grid. <laughs> and so we said, okay, let's see if we could, the only way we're going to figure this thing out, and this is, uh, I think, uh, important as you think about the United States in, in the context of of how other countries are tackling this challenge, we don't have, you know, this is in France or China or Brazil where you have a central planning authority that goes and figures this stuff out and then sort of kind of makes it happen. Uh, we depend more on a state-by-state -state approach uh, with limited federal powers, and we rely more on the, uh, on, you know, sort of rambunctious private actors to go come up with harebrained schemes and try to, try to make them happen. And... Uh, we thought that was an advantage to us, so that was sort of the inspiration for, for starting Clean Line. You had asked about regulatory and, yeah. and political issues. One of the things that really struck me um, was that in reporting and learning about this project you were working on, which was going to deliver an absolutely an enormous amount of renewable energy, 3.5, 4 gigawatts worth of wind, um, that you were running into the very type of bureaucratic delays, lengthy process to get a decision from governments, um, long environmental uh, reviews, the exact same things that as a, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, I would write about for natural gas pipelines. I mean, the same issues. And Keystone at the time. And Keystone, absolutely. I mean, it's the same. So it's sort of fascinating to me that there's, well, maybe not fascinating, I think I can understand why, but there's never been this sort of unholy alliance between renewable energy developers and fossil fuel developers to sort of say, you know, we've got some of the same issues here. Uh, we don't necessarily want to expedite this to get a yes. We just want an answer. You know, it'd be helpful if within five years we could get a yes or no. Because one of the things you dealt with, I didn't think that was going to be a laugh line. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things you dealt with was that, you know, it took, not what, nine, ten years before you found, you know, to, to get a lot of the answers you needed to get. And you had your investors sitting there sort of saying, okay, you know, this is... This is, this is a fun ride. We right, enjoy hanging right. out with you, but, you know, the whole purpose here is to build something. 
Yeah, so the question is, is there some unholy alliance? Yeah, we're here in Houston. Where's the, I mean, is there a, is there a infrastructure expedition? Or the, the, yeah, I think the key, if we could just agree, the, the, the problem that we're, we're kind of high-sided on this thing because we can't agree on carbon, okay, which is really the fundamental issue. And if you, if you can't agree on carbon, it, people feel like they got to fight about everything else. OK, and so we're in a in a mess of a situation where uh, you uh, you if, if you say, well, we're, the government's not going to do anything about carbon, I got to go fight this pipeline, which makes it, it. Whereas if you had a price on carbon, then the market could could sort these things out and then you could build the right infrastructure. Um, so if out of Houston, there are. You know, we said, we, the city of Houston, we agree that there should be a, a price on carbon. And uh, by the way, natural gas would do extremely well. Uh, coal would do phenomenally poorly. Um, and if you look at the, the pr even like $20 a ton on the price of gas is actually pretty low. It's a, it's a minimal impact at the pump. So if Houston could agree on that, I think we would send a really powerful signal to, to the rest of the country. So you, you just brought us into Texas, and um, one of the things I'd like for you, you both to maybe wax a little bit on is uh, the state of Texas has, you know, over a quarter of the nation's wind capacity, um, something like 27% of the nation's wind generation is in this state. Um, a lot of that has been really aided by the CRES, the Competitive Renewable Energy Zones, the expansion of $7 billion expansion of power lines to move stuff from the west to the east where people live, uh, where load is. Um, and it's interesting when you're actually in West Texas because you can see wind farms and pumper jacks juxtaposed next to each other, and that's just a, a fascinating sort of thing to see. Um, but Texas seems to be a place where a lot of this stuff has been happening. And I wonder if you could talk about maybe what you see is going right here versus what has gone wrong in other parts of the country. Is it simply because you have to cross state lines um, and you deal with different regulatory environments, or is it something more complicated? Well, I mean, it, it partially it's because you have to deal, you know, um, someone in the, in the energy industry has a great expression that we don't have, you know, one energy policy, we don't have one energy grid, we have 50 different energy policies and 50 different energy grids, and it's true. Um, and it's really difficult to, to sort of negotiate your way through that. But, you know, it, you know, it would be sort of a fascinating experiment if, if uh, a politician would come out and say, look, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to socialize the cost of building um, a new power grid. Um, not a new power grid, but an overlay, a second power grid that's going to move around a lot of renewable energy. And I think that the result will be a lot of jobs and a lot of construction and much lower wholesale prices. So we'll all end up saving money. And we'll all pay a little bit more on our bill. And you know, the kicker to that would be, and that's exactly what Texas did. Uh, and, and it succeeded. So, you know, the Texas experiment, essentially, was to go out and build this, the, the, uh, a new grid to these competitive zones, the CRES zones, uh, to enable the construction of wind, uh, to spread that cost around so you didn't have private actors coming out and having to, to, to take the chance. And uh, I think it's been a remarkable success. I mean, we have a, a very robust renewable ener energy industry. We've got very low wholesale uh, costs of electricity. Um, and with the exception of the odd um, afternoon where prices at $9,000 per kilowatt hour, um, the, the, system, the system works. And frankly, that's not an example of the system not working. That's just the way the system, the Texas system has been built. You know, you know, we, we don't have brownouts and we have good average prices. So, um, so a, a, a couple of really important dimensions that. So in Texas, we have a separation of, of the people who run the grid and the people who own generation. And that's super important. In other jurisdictions, if you build a transmission line, you, will, you may hurt some other generator, okay, because you're going to equalize the price of power. By separating those two, you keep the generators out of the interfering with how infrastructure decisions get built. That's, that's a super important piece of the, our design in Texas. And the other is, is markets. And uh, there was, you know, the discussion, okay, we hit this price cap. Oh, my gosh, this is terrible. The prices went that high. What happens is electricity costs that much in other jurisdictions for a few hours a year. They just bury it in everybody's rates. 
And what happens then is nobody really knows. And so you don't get the innovation cycle that we get in Texas. So what's happening now is every storage developer, energy storage developer worth their salt is ordering batteries and trying to get projects built for next year. So this price spike that we saw last year or last week um, will be the, either the last, mark my words, don't send me your bill if I'm wrong, by the way, <laughs> um, but uh, will either be the last or the penultimate spike that we see in Texas because you're going to see a massive influx of, of solar and storage chasing that very price signal. And that, that cycle of innovation is dramatically accelerated by really healthy, robust markets. So the idea is you go out and you build solar because if you look at the long range forecast or the next week forecast, say, okay, it's going to be 100 in Houston, Dallas, uh, Austin, and San Antonio. So I know prices are going to spike. I will bank it right now and make myself available to sell. Yeah, so you build it and, and, and you're going to make a. All right, I'm out of here. I'm, I, think I, I think I can do that. <laughs> You'll make a ton of money uh, next year if you get your solar project or your battery online. And now that's the great news. The bad news is everybody, you're not the only person around with that idea. <laughs> so the party may only last a year or two, but the benefits of sometimes destructive competition will accrue to consumers. Will and you be able to get the power, though? Do you need to build that solar close to Houston or close to Dallas? Or can you build it out in West Texas where land is cheap? Yeah. Because you're seeing a lot of development. I mean, I was sort of stunned when I, last time I looked at the, the ERCOT queue, how much development was going on in Brazoria and Fort Bend and sort of kind of right around Houston yeah. to avoid transmission. Yeah. So um, the oil and gas analogy is that everybody drilled all these wells out in the Permian and all of a sudden they got nowhere to go with their gas or oil. So you got huge bases, yeah. differentials. Right. Open. Same thing happens in wind. Uh, it turns out that if you give a wind or solar developer a pile of money, they will build you a project, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I assure you, okay? And the same thing seems to be true of, uh, of people in the oil and gas business. If you give them some money, they will find some holes that are absolutely worth drilling. And uh, so the, one of the biggest challenges in, on the renewal side of things is that uh, we, we've, we're, we're just, the, the world is, as we know, at least for the moment, awash in money, and uh, projects are getting built, um, sometimes without a, a completely clear understanding of some of the congestion risks that they might be stepping into. This actually raises a, another point I want to I wanna get to. Um, uh, earlier this year, I was in, in Norway, and I found it fascinating that a lot of the discussion uh, was really about building more long-distance transmission to connect Norway to Denmark and the Netherlands, where there's a fantastic wind resource, and there's been a lot of wind capacity expansion. And It's not really hard to figure out why, because all the hydro in Norway basically acts like the battery for wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you connect the, the, the two regions up, it makes for a fantastic story about how you actually can use trade to keep the system balanced. Um, unfortunately, not everywhere in the world looks like Norway and Northwest Europe. Um, but it does raise an interesting question when you think about what's going on in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about expansion of renewables, about storage, uh, and there's some utilities that are actually going all in on developing utility scale storage in different parts of the country. But um, at some point, you have to think about, well, if you start doing this in various parts of the country, you have to eventually end up thinking about connections. Uh, and you, could, you really just have to study the history of, of the way the grid evolved to where it is today to understand why. Oh, if, right? if you so, buy the book, you will yeah. understand that. Yeah, so, and, then, and that's the point. But, but do you think, because politics are local, right? And, and, and ultimately what gets in the way of some of these projects are local issues. Do you think that that's a, a hurdle or a bridge too far? Or is it something we can actually overcome? You know, so I'm I'm sort of an optimist. I'm I'm an optimist. I I do think we can kind of overcome it. Um, the we got to figure out ways for the incumbents to play a a bigger role. Um, they own the rights away. They can deploy capital. But most importantly, they have sort of a a, a, a social contract. So. The big advantage that utilities have is, you know, they've been around for 100 years. People, they keep the lights on. Uh, they're not always beloved, but regulators and other folks know that if they do really bad things, that, 
you know, the regulator, the legislature, they can take it out of their hide later. So, and that's not really written down anywhere, but this is, that's kind of the way the system works. Our biggest challenge was, as an independent upstart, uh, was trying to replicate as much of a social contract as we could. So, you know, robust landowner payments, uh, convincing a French manufacturer to build an insulator factory in Arkansas, uh, earning the, the trust of the chambers of commerce, uh, working with ag groups, et cetera, et cetera. And we had to go sort of try to replicate as much of that as possible. We didn't do, obviously, we didn't do enough of it. Um, and it's sort of like a, a political campaign where you, like, you can never do enough. Um, but if we can figure out ways to get the incumbents to think about this, we will ha we'll be better off. And one of, the, one of the advantages in other jurisdictions is you have much larger utilities, like, like U.S. utilities are actually quite small on a, on a global scale. If you look at state grid of China and southern grid and the German utilities and the French utility, they've got the whole – they've got resource to load. And that's a very potent combination that, you know, maybe we'll see as we see more consolidation in the space. Oh. But it was – that was hard to, to – that was a hard nut to crack. We've also created these regulated utilities where – they don't just deliver power. You know, they deliver jobs. They deliver political connections. They deliver, um, you, know, uh, you know, in the case of the Tennessee Valley Authority, you know, they, they provide recreation on lakes. And we're sort of asking our utilities to do lots of things when what we probably should be asking our power companies to be doing, it's going to be a radical idea, but providing power, you know, at the lowest cost uh, rate. And one of the things you ran into was that you had this kind of, the idea when you when you were trying to sell power to Tennessee in the Tennessee Valley, some of their politicians, which looked at their local utility as this source of basically patronage, um, and you were basically saying, "Yeah, well, we're going to generate all this good power in Oklahoma, and sell it to you in Tennessee." And they're like, "No, no, no, we like our jobs here in Tennessee." Yeah. And so, you know, one of the, the, the issues really is that we're looking at, I think we're looking at our, our regular utilities for, for too much right now. It, may, it, made, it makes sense to me 80 to 100 years ago when you create these regulated utilities to say to them, look, we're going to give you a monopoly. We're going to give, you know, we're going to give you a guaranteed profit and rate of return because you need access to capital to go out and build a giant, um, you know, distribution lines everywhere so everyone can get electricity in their houses. That makes sense. Today, it doesn't make as nearly as much sense. They don't need to go out and, and, and build out this giant system. They, and... It's, I've been very frustrated with, you, with utilities. It's interesting recently. to interject something there um, before you jump in, Michael. Um, you're really talking about utilities were, were looked upon to provide public service obligation, right? They, they had an obligation to provide power to the local community, to the local area, region, whatever it may be, how big, how large the utility is. But um, with the evolution of technology and the ability to actually do different things in the power grid, uh, long term, does it's sort of the question I think maybe underneath what you're saying is, is that public up service obligation diminishing? Um, y yes, I mean I think yeah, I, absolutely. And um, I also look at the track record of some of these regulated utilities, um, which should have an incredible advantage low cost of capital, guaranteed returns, and yet, what are they doing? You know, southern companies going out and building this giant Kemper facility, which was a, a massive boondoggle. Uh, they're building a nuke that's running billions and billions of dollars uh, over budget. Um, you know, I've spent most of this year reporting on PG&E out in California, which has just had a host of problems. Um, and, and frankly, I, I'm still trying to figure out how a company comes out of bankruptcy in 2004 is a regulated profit, a regulated utility, and goes back into bankruptcy 15 years later. If someone can explain that to me, I'd appreciate it. Um, and, um, you know, so th th there's something wrong with this model. There's something wrong with the regulated utility model. And, and you know, I, I'm just, I'm not convinced we need them I don't think the evidence is there that we need them for the social compact, for the provision of power. And uh, I, I think at this point where we are 
talking about an energy transition where people are interested in an energy transition because it will provide lower carbon resources and it will provide lower price power uh, by and large as wind prices keep coming down and solar prices keep coming down. We need to have more innovation in there and regulated utilities are not known for being innovative. It's interesting. So by the way, for those of you who don't track this space very closely, everything that Russell was just talking about is a major point of de debate across the country in public utility commissions, et cetera. So um, it's a very active space that the public, unfortunately, doesn't know a whole lot about. But it's, it's, a, it's a very... Maybe a quick, like, 30 seconds on where we are with wind and solar Please, since yeah, yeah. the president tweeted that it's not working. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, all, I, all... You know, you should talk quickly because if the wind goes out in West Texas, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to lose the mics. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Um, so uh, wind energy, all you got to remember about wind is pi r squared, okay? So r is the length of the blade, that's the radius, and every time you increase the length of the blade, your swept area, okay, which is what a wind turbine does, it sweeps the area, the wind blows through, and it turns that air into mechanical energy and then electrical energy. And when I started doing wind, I don't know, before the dawn of time, um, the uh, you know, machines were 47 meters in diameter. The new GE machines, offshore machines, are 220 meters in diameter. And to give you a sense of the energy in that 220 meter rotor uh, with a 20 mile an hour wind, you have 450 tons of air per second passing through the plane of the rotor. So it's a staggering amount of energy. Um, and the cost has come down and down and down, and, and we can now produce uh, wind for right around the avoided cost of burning natural gas at three bucks. So I know we're like, I know it's painful for many in the audience, but we're at two something in natural gas, but at about three bucks, uh, wind is right on top. That's just the burn cost or the avoided cost of fuel. And in solar, cost has come down almost 90% in the last decade, and uh, we're right on top of the uh, similar price point. So from an energy, capacity is a different thing. That's like the, the think of, of electric power as two things, energy and capacity. Energy is the uh, challenging part, and that's what produces emissions. Uh, capacity is you hit the light switch, and somewhere there's a machine reacting a little bit uh, in response to that. So costs are super cheap, and... Um, Every time that we think, you know, we sort of run out of gas on technology improvements, uh, something else comes along. And in Texas, we're at about 20% wind today, and we will be uh, at about 30% wind and solar in about five or six years. It's been growing rapidly, absolutely. So what I want to do now is actually open it up to the floor. We've got some time for some questions, and I'll start right here, actually. Please. Just recently, TVA put out their IRP which you, you were bidding in TVA, 15 gigawatts of solar and 5 gigawatts of storage. Have you done the analysis to see how badly you would beat that? Because that would be a good next step. <laughs> right. was one of your problems, right? They yeah. used to play. Yeah. Now they went out to the society and said, we're going to do the right thing, and we're going to build 15 gigawatts of solar and 5 gigawatts of solar of uh, storage, which probably matches very closely what you were offering. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if they're going to do 15 gigawatts of solar, they're going to, they're going to, there's this thing in California called the duck curve where prices crash in the middle of the day. They will, the duck will quack very loudly in the Tennessee Valley. Yep. Um, and then they'll need the storage, which is good. So we would have beaten those numbers for sure. Well, your point is how do you validate, you know, this discussion, discussion on transmission lines? And this is a perfect use case because you had very specific numbers in right. Very easily compared to what the utility is very publicly having to put out their plan just recently. So I right. So we went round and round and round with with TVA. At the end of the day, uh, they were under a lot of pressure from Senator Lamar Alexander to do nothing, and uh, that's what they did. And we showed them on many occasions. This is why it's cheaper than than all these other alternatives. But it didn't really go anywhere. This was part of the Eisenberg uncertainty principle. It was like. Russell, you cannot FOIA their internal discussions while we're trying to get them to do this because you'll mess it up. But afterwards, we did FOIA the internal discussions. And TVA, which is a federal agency, essentially came back and said, we can't provide to you 
how we arrived at our numbers. So it was a black box. And I said, well, that's, you know, usually when you, you have something like that, they'll say, well, it's a, a business deliberation and the company involved. And I said, no, no, the company involved will, will be fine with it. Um, but they didn't want to. And I, to this day, suspect that, that those numbers don't really ever exist. Um, and if you look at the IRP, uh, actually, they, the numbers that they use for wind to try to figure out, the numbers for wind are much higher than what they could have bought at. So instead of saying, well, we had one company that came in and was trying to sell us for 1850, uh, right, was 1850 per megawatt hour? You know, they're sort of gaming the numbers at like 30 or $40 per megawatt hour. And I remember when I read this, this was after the book came out, just sort of scratching my head, sort of saying, where are they coming up with these numbers? They don't make any sense. They have an actual company that wanted to come in at lower, so at least give it a $25. Uh, it, it, was very, it was very bizarre, and they have not been called to account fully for it yet. Up here. Uh, yeah, a couple things. First, um, a lot of the eastern U.S. knows a lot about what they don't want. Any idea where those electrons are going to come from? And second, uh, Michael, something you mentioned about the, the supply in Texas and the, the uh, daily variations in demand in California, that's going to have to make ERCOT an exporter. Is that <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's sort of exactly backwards to what uh, what their uh, uh, remand is. Yeah, I mean, you, you could, so the Panhandle of Texas is actually in the Southwest Power Pool, so you could do it that way. But to your question on on the Northeast, I mean, this is sort of an interesting example of uh, what happens when we get in these infrastructure fights. So, in the Northeast has been pretty successful, New York State, Massachusetts, in shutting down new gas pipelines. And the environmentalists would say, we're doing this uh, because we care about carbon, which I, I believe that they do. Um, and they wanted to force offshore wind, and they have been successful. So what's happening in, tax, in offshore Massachusetts is they're, we're about to embark upon a huge build-out of offshore wind uh, far enough off the horizon so that... Um, uh, actually, Senator Alexander won't be able to see it because he has a house in, in Nantucket <laughs> as well. Um, but um, and the the uh, the price of that offshore wind is coming down because thanks to the Northern Europeans who spent a ton of money on developing offshore technology. But it's still, you know, the numbers would be like fifty dollars a ton carbon. Okay, so if we had a thirty dollar ton carbon price, you might build the pipelines and uh, build renewable or lower carbon resources elsewhere, and all in, it would cost uh, less money. But when you make resource decisions based on infrastructure, you do end up with you know, suboptimal outcomes if you're, if you're just into the numbers part of this. Now, I, but I also understand that there is, I mean, it is a real thing that people in Massachusetts want to know that their electricity is coming from turbines out in the water. Like that, that's, uh, that's a real, like, that would be kind of cool. Like when I ride the, if you ride the train in France, you know that it's coming from almost all carbon-free nuclear power. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. So um, just to answer your other question. Is that answering answer the question? What? No, no, no. The, the Earth <laughs> question, the export question. There's a very simple solution. I think my sense is if you were to, somehow write a law that would make sure that the PUC of Texas is not superseded by the federal government. In other words, that Texas, even as an exporter, is not really involved in interstate commerce, you know, it's sort of a fiction, uh, then I think that that would solve all problems and Texas could become a major exporter. I think that's the one holdup is, is they, you know, Austin doesn't want to be regulated by uh, Washington, D.C. on this. Yeah. So even though the clean line lines weren't built, the need for... Not yet. We'll get to that. <laughs> Interstate is, is going to continue to grow. We had lines built in Texas. That was sort of a unique circumstance with the CREZ being in state. So what is it going to look like that's going to get us major high voltage lines built um, in other parts of the country? So, um, not to give away the ending, but... Um, so we ended up selling off our projects 
Uh, one in New Mexico, very confident that'll go into construction next year. Uh, another one from Kansas to Indiana, uh, bought by a company called Avenergy, which is owned by a very tenacious Ukrainian immigrant who's very successful in the power industry. I think he'll get that done. Uh, our uh, Plains and Eastern project, which is the main subject of the, vault of the book, it's, it was sort of half bought by uh, Next Era, and I think they'll ultimately do something with it. So uh, as Russell puts it, hopefully a second mouse will get this cheese. And um, so where do we end up? I think we're going to do, we'll get a couple of these big HVDC lines done. We won't, it feels difficult, at least in the medium term, that we would have a Chinese type solution where they have done a, a massive, massive infrastructure build out over the last uh, really 20 years or so and built uh, many, many billions of dollars of extra high voltage lines. I think we'll end up with lower voltage AC solutions, which are, you know, ultimately mean more right away, less efficient, um, more costly, and we'll sort of, sort of fumble our way through it in that. And then we'll do things that, you know, are not uh, like offshore wind that maybe isn't as economic as some other solutions. But so I, I do think we're going to continue to to work our way through this, but we may not do it in, in as, in as efficiently or as cost, cost effectively or as, in as timely a fashion as we, as we really, really need to do it. Um, back up here in the back. Uh, yes, um, I'm, I'm a German citizen besides an American citizen. And Germany has a rather progressive <coughs> policy because at one point in a parliamentary maneuver, all of the Christian Democrats left the chamber and the red-green government managed to pass the very progressive energy policy that Germany has, which is a national energy policy. And I would ask you gentlemen, how's that going to happen here? Uh, are the Republicans one day going to disappear from the chamber and everybody's going to decide, oh, because, because by the way, my understanding, this has done the like in an hour and a half. They, they pass all these things concerning German wind energy, German nuclear energy, and all this sort of stuff. And then when the conservatives came back into power, it was impossible to take away because it was quite popular. And I was just asking you two questions. Don't we need a national energy policy to address the issues that, that you've been raising? And if so, how is that going to happen? <laughs> it's been my experience that political solutions don't come about until the technology and the market case is pretty much there. And then the politicians will sort of ride through, right, here in the United States, will ride through in the last minute and claim victory, even though a lot of the work's been done. I think we're heading in that direction with the lower price renewables, with storage entering, you know, with, with more storage. So I think we're, we're entering a, a, a time when it is possible for the politicians to come to an agreement and sort of ride in at the last moment. Um, you know, to go back to, to this, we've been discussing offshore wind. 20 years people tried to do offshore wind. For 20 years it was beaten back by regulatory and lawsuits. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was a technology change. But also what happened was is that the offshore wind industry in the United States kind of came to a realization that if they went to state capitals in New England and said, hey, look, that dilapidated port, we can come back and bring jobs. And they sort of found the special sauce to make it more palatable. So the energy industry, the renewable energy industry, hasn't found quite that special sauce yet. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic that we're gonna see something happen. I don't think it's gonna be a national energy policy, but there'll be just enough. I mean, we didn't have a national energy policy on fracking and that completely took off. What we had was a decision to, to regulate water in a certain way that made fracking very possible. So it was sort of a, kind of a quiet, you know, underhanded national energy policy. The, the other thing is that I, I do think that the conversation on carbon is, is really moving along, in, particularly in the last 18 to 24 months. And, you know, most Fortune 500 companies are doing a, a fairly detailed look at their, uh, the carbon intensity of their operations, and they're trying to figure out, like, what to do. Now, they, when they, as they take actions around this, the electric power side of this equation is probably the easiest to solve. Once you get into transportation and other areas, you know, low-grade heat, et cetera, then it gets really, really hard. But 
most companies out there are trying to figure and this includes oil and gas companies who are you know that for them it's obviously particularly difficult but there are things that they can do to reduce the carbon intensity and uh, there's people in the audience working on this topic um, so um, it's it feels a lot more real than than I don't know the last maybe it was 2010 when we had the other big debate Okay, go ahead. Uh, a two-part question. Now, is the federal government still giving subsidies per kilowatt hour produced by wind power? And what does it cost to build one big turbine? Yeah, so um, does the federal government still subsidize wind and solar? Right now, there's something called the production tax credit, uh, and that is begins to fade out in 2020, and by 2023, it's gone. And similarly with, with solar. So you have to get the project on there's a bunch of tax rules and so on around this but basically it goes away um and in general the industry is is fairly confident that you know we can hit that the price point that i was talking about uh a little bit earlier in terms of the cost of the machine it just depends on the size of the machine the bigger the more costly but there are efficiencies i remember our friend pi r squared um the pi has a fixed cost and a foundation which doesn't scale as you know there are economies of scale with bigger machines and so on so those are all kicking in two or three million dollars well a typical machine that you might see in west texas a two call it a three megawatt machine all in that's about three million bucks if you'd like one for your ranch i have some friends who i'm sure <laughs> could, be, could hook you up <coughs> right over here um Yes, so two questions. First, I, I enjoyed the book very much, but um, the question is how important is the compatibility of story to the future growth of renewals? You talk about them, and I'm wondering with Tesla and other companies investing millions, are we pretty close to a long-term storage issue uh, that, that is addressing this compatibility yeah. aspect? Second question is, is there a possibility to lay these lines underground? We can lay them offshore. <laughs> is, is that an area of technology yeah. or is it economic? No, I'll, I'll go, I'll, let me go with the first one. So, because uh, Russell and I differ on the second one. Um, on the, uh, actually, what was, what was the first question again? <laughs> storage. Storage. storage, okay. Yeah. So we've had this challenge before. <laughs> Back in the 60s and 70s, we built a bunch of nuclear power plants, and then we had all this electricity at night that we didn't know what to do with. So we built a bunch of pump storage facilities where you pump water up a hill, put it in the reservoir, and then during the day, you let the water come back down the hill when you need the power and, and run a turbine with it. So uh, those are expensive and uh, difficult to, to build. Today's predominant form of new storage is uh, lithium-ion batteries. Uh, um, and we all carry those around in our pockets. So we're building a lot of, uh, there's a lot of capacity in lithium ion in the world, and uh, the costs are coming down. Um, we'll probably get to about half of today's cost in the next, you know, six years or so. Once we get to there, we sort of, the, the curve starts to flatten out. Um, and it's short duration storage. So ironically, Storage, lithium ion is best for solar when you're trying to move intraday. Um, wind is, uh, uh, doesn't really have the, if you spread the wind out enough, you don't have, it doesn't show up all at the same time. So it's a little bit less of a challenge. Store, you can integrate a lot more wind than you can store it, than you can solar without a lot of storage. Um, but there are a bunch of people that are figuring, that are, working in the labs, I'm on the board of one of these companies, um, across the country, trying to crack this nut of long-term storage of storing energy for you know, days, weeks, even, even months at a time. And there's some pro exciting developments out there. So um, I'm optimistic. Well, I would also say, I mean, even without storage, if you build a big enough grid, because the United, North America is a continent, and it's always windy somewhere, and it's usually sunny somewhere, that you can move the, even without storage, you can move around enough of the electrons to lower the price yeah, and to integrate that. a lot more renewables um, on the grid than we can right now. Um, and, uh, and then when you start adding storage, it only makes that more efficient. 
So underground, that is a huge debate going on right now. Um, there's one project in uh, Iowa, uh, into the Chicago area, that plans to bury a, a high voltage direct current line um, next to the Canadian Pacific Rail uh, corridor. Uh, it is more expensive to do that. Um, and there are some very legitimate questions about whether it's going to be too expensive, essentially. It breaks the economics of it. Uh, technologically, absolutely no question. It can be done. It's being done. It's being done in Germany. It's being done in other places. Uh, we have the technology. The economics of it are, are not clear. Um, maybe Elon Musk could take his boring company and <laughs> figure out how to, to drive down the cost. It, it, honestly, if, if, if I were running ARPA-E, you know, the, 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 the federal government's um, R&D, energy R&D, I would be looking for, for ways to drive down that cost because um, if, you can, if you can bury these lines, I, don't, I think I, I, you probably have a better sense than I, but at least half, I think, of the opposition disappears. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right here. Okay, two part question. Um, Probably heard more about uh, the potential role of microgrids, how they can be integrated and you know, provide uh, the local needs and diminish the needs for big transportation of energy. That's one question. The other one is on the uh, on the uh, storage, the role of natural gas, an example in the Permian. Uh, to compensate for the intermittence of uh, wind farms, and how do you see that role into the future? Um, so on microgrids, okay, so the question is, what's the role of microgrids and natural gas as a storage medium? Uh, on the first, I'm not, so microgrids, so rice could have a microgrid, but you still need a source of generation, okay? And the world, in general, tends toward network solutions. And as soon as you have one microgrid somewhere, if you want to enhance the reliability of that microgrid, what you ought to do is connect it to the other microgrid so you can lean on it when your microgrid has a problem. Um, so um, there's interesting technology, but it's not solving the real issue of like how do we generate power, which is the, the big challenge. And then natural gas... Um, Sure, it does complement renewables, uh, but as does the grid and as does storage, as, as we've I talked about. I think we're using natural gas right oh, yeah. now to balance renewables. Absolutely. Well, natural gas has actually played a, a big role in balancing uh, uh, the Texas market in particular, um, where you've seen coal decline steadily um, as renewables and gas have actually grown. So they, they, they do work lockstep with one another. Uh, back here. Uh, how do you think we'll deal with some of the issues that we're running into in Wyoming and Scotland with the disposal of these blades? I don't know if we're going to actually mm -hmm. take them down and have to uh, involve as what becomes we have to dispose of these blades. I'm, can I give you an honest answer? I haven't fully looked at that yet. That's a great question. Um, you know, we are. Most of the new, most of the modern wind farms really started going in about 2005 or so. So you figure a 20-year lifespan, that's an issue that's coming up. Um, uh, I, I don't have a great answer for you right now. I, I need to look at that. Yeah. So on disposal of, of the old equipment, I mean, so you have a gearbox with oil in it, which obviously you got to deal with that, and you have fiberglass, which I don't know that much about fiberglass, but it's fairly, as I understand it, it's fairly inert material and not doesn't represent a long-term health hazard, but somebody could correct me on that. And then you got lots of metal, which you can recycle. So it's it's a typically not seen as a big as a big challenge for the industry growth. Uh, there are concern about lithium ion. What do we do with all these old batteries? Um, and there are people working at trying to figure out how to extract lithium from those because you know this is a material that's worth like eight thousand bucks a ton. So there's a big incentive to to get the lithium back out. There's also a lot of what, what's called repowering, where you take an old wind farm and you just basically put in brand new turbines. Um, and I can't see why you can't make it approval to repower a wind farm contingent upon the appropriate disposal of, of the blades. Um, you know, you wanna do this, you wanna keep this lease and keep, keep producing, great. But you know, this is, we need A, B, and C, you know, to, to do with the, the old blades. I don't know, hopefully we can find something good to do with them. That'd be wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to 
this is going to be the last question because we're up against it. Um, and I've seen hands up a lot, and I'm sorry if I'm not calling your name, uh, but I'm sure if your question uh, uh, can, can wait until at the end, uh, uh, both Michael and Russell would be happy to entertain it. But I'm going to go back up here, um, right there. Yeah. yeah, so on a high level, can you explain how the commercial structure works for some of these renewable developments? Like if you're generating solar power and you're basically getting zero money per kilowatt, how do you make money on that? <laughs> That's a really good question. So, um, f so first of all, like, like, how does that happen? Like, how do you get zero dollars per kilowatt hour? Um, there will be times when you're generating, okay, and you're not getting paid. Other hours, you're getting paid a lot, and so you're gonna aver you're gonna project that forward and estimate what your long-term revenue stream is going to look like, and hopefully you're right. But And you can also get people to take the other side of that trade. So there's lots of hedge providers and other people that participate in the market. Alternatively, you could just build a Bitcoin farm there when you've got... <laughs> <laughs> That's actually, that is a thing. That is actually a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, everybody, please uh, join me in thanking uh, both Michael and, and Russell. Um, and uh, for those of you who are interested, and this is a, a, an opportunity to um, actually chat a little bit more with Russell in particular, 